Welcome to Art Zone. Art Zone is a profile of art and artists in the Rockford area. Hi, I'm Doc Slavkowski, and this is the Art Zone. We're coming to you from J.R. Cortman Center for Design downtown in the heart of Rockford's cultural district. The Rockford Art Museum features the spectacular murals of Chicago artist Dan Gustin. We'll show you an interview with the artist from his Chicago studio. Then Marilyn Moore, director of Gallery 451, will tell us about their opening featuring artist David Lundahl. But first, let's go upstairs and take a look at the screened images exhibition that was held at the Cortman Gallery. We're now upstairs at Cafe Esperanto, which houses the Cortman Gallery, and we're featuring the show Screened Images, which highlights the works of three Rockford screen artists, uh, Perry Donzi, Brian Endel, and George Frabatko. The pieces behind me here are of George Frabatko's works, and they are in great detail in the fact that they use eight to 10 color uh, screen images that are put on top of the paper, and that's why you get such detail in these uh, images. And now we're going to go to, we'll take you to Creative Pigmind Studio to talk with artist Brian Endel, and then over to Saturn Studios to talk to artist Perry Donzi. We're at Creative Pigmind Studio and retail store talking with Brian Endel, one of the featured artists in the Screened Images show at the Cortman Gallery. Why don't you comment a little bit about your work that you have showing in the gallery at, at Cortman's? Well, most of my pieces, well, all three of my pieces are um, Rockford-related pieces of kind of a crude, colorful um, downtown scenes, uh, such as a symbol in black on black. And uh, uh, one, of the, one of the swans over at the Mississippi Lagoons and the third one is a downtown scene with the news tower and the State Street Bridge. What's the si significance of doing the symbol in black? Well, there's such a love-hate relationship in Rockford about the symbol. And um, when I originally was wanting to do a, a Rockford piece, I thought the symbol is very recognizable. But there are so many people who hate it, and then there are other people who love it. So I want to do it in a different way where the people who hated it maybe would like it a little more, and it would make it a little bit more interesting. And tell us about now the creative process of putting together silk screening, because one of the reasons that you were selected for the show, I know, is that not only do you do this as an artist, but also in a commercial way. So there is a, there's a technical process that takes place to putting Right. A, a screen image together. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, the toughest part is, I guess, coming up with the idea and, and creating the art. And once you have that created, you have to um, use, uh, you make the films out of, uh, you know, like uh, film positives. And then you have a photosensitive um, emulsion is put down on a screen. And uh, the films are then burned on, or the images are burned into the screen. And where the images on the film are uh, show up on the screen. And it's, say there's uh, several colors. Each, each, each one of those colors is a separate screen. And it's just a matter of, after you have that done, it's um, a very easy process of just slapping the, the, uh, you know, the paper down on on our printing board. It's a vacuum board has, that holds the paper down, has a vacuum on it, and just printing one color at a time. It has a registration. You have to set up registration, of course, on it. So is each, that difficult? Is that the most, what is the most difficult thing about it? Uh, as far as the printing process? Right. Um, probably just the time it takes to make the films and that. Um, actually, doing the printing is actually very relaxing. It's, uh, I find it just slapping it down and pulling. And, and you'll see the first color comes off and then we throw it, we have a, a belt dryer. The paper actually goes through the dryer. I don't know if everyone does it this way, this way we do it. And then it comes out the other end, we have it set up so each page just stacks up. And then 
um, when you have, say for instance, we have 30 prints, the first color goes down in all 30 and say it's six color job, then we have to do the same process for each color. And each one is uh, registered. We have a, it's like a three hole punch. Uh, it has three holes and then you have pins that it's, it pops in the same place every time. So that's, you get it basically exact registration well, that, and then you trim that three hole uh, section off the paper is no longer on there you throw that away let's go see you, you your studio is right back here and then also the place where you where you actually what do you call that where you uh work? just the shop okay the, the printing area all right let's go and look at we have artist proofs back here All right, I'm Mike Tarali, and I'm Brian's partner. And uh, I handle a lot of the printing back here that he just explained so precisely and, and uh, eloquently. Uh, now, this is this is our printer. This is what we do for all our apparel, our textiles on the T-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, whatever else we decide to print on. And uh, it's a six-color press. You spin these around, and he explained all the uh, the screens and how you operate the different colors and all that. We put T-shirts on here. Print one color, you know, spin it around, print the next one, next one, next depending on how many colors you have. And then you finally hit it with the last color, you pull it off, and you throw it on the belt. And it goes through and it cures the ink to the garment. We're now at Saturn Studio talking with Perry Donzi, and uh, this is not only your creative environment, but you also have a residence upstairs, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But yeah. we'd like to hear your comments on the uh, Cortman Gallery show, uh, Screened Images. And um, specifically, why don't we talk about the Jefferson Street Bridge image that you uh, decided to use in it? Um, actually, I, I always thought that the Jefferson Street Bridge was like an amazing structure. I've always thought that. And... It's just a thing that you drive over every day, and nobody notices it because you're just driving over it. But if you see it from the side, it's just totally amazing. And I think I think I always thought it was an incredible art piece, uh, artistically and uh, architecturally. And uh, and uh, you guys wanted uh, to do like a, a project on Rockford. I thought that was a perfect subject to pick from. Now that's derived from originally a photograph. Tell us a little bit about the process of putting uh, the images together. Okay, what I did was um, I started, this is almost like cheating. I never never did this before, but uh, I used to uh, want to do, do everything by eye, okay? But, you know, this, these are the 90s, so you use the tools that are available to you. So I took a slide of the bridge with a uh, wide-angle lens, and I projected it onto paper just to get the perspective right in the first place. But it's not a shortcut, believe me. Uh, I could show you the films if you want to see them. They almost drove me nuts. Uh, as a matter of fact, we should show those. Sure. Uh, and get those out. I, I'll, I'll get those out, yeah. yeah. We do that after we talk here. Oh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I think I, I lost my vision doing this, as a matter of fact. I think I have to get glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, it was uh, very interesting. It's 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 really funny because uh, most of my stuff is real uh, extreme, real uh, uh, imaginative, real uh, you know erratic type type stuff. But uh, some of those this, pieces are in the show too. Yeah, they are in the show. Yeah, and uh, I show these pieces to like certain people, and they go, "This is the best stuff you've ever done." It's like, well. 
you know, different <laughs> strokes for different folks, you know, I guess. The interesting thing about also, for instance, on the Jefferson Street Bridge uh, image, the colors that you chose to present it, which makes you look at it in an entirely different way. How did you choose those colors? Um, I was trying to get like the, uh, that old time feeling, uh, the, uh, the 20s and 30s type feeling, because it is a, an old structure. So I thought I'd choose the colors accordingly, but then uh, use some lavenders, you know, and to give it kind of a new feel too at the same time. But uh, the orange background, orange and blue, is like an old combo, like the old railroad uh, advertisements in National Geographic or whatever. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Also on the Memorial Hall, um, how? Why did you choose that building? Because it's so cool. It's so cool. It's like. I can't believe that they actually thought about tearing it down a long time ago. Do you believe that? No. No. You know, come on. Get out of here. You know, it's, if they tore that down, I'd move out of Rockford. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about, like, the process now of, of putting this together? You um, Tell us a little bit about that. After you, you, you take the photographic image and then you put it on film, you say? Serographic printers. Is it, we, uh, we separate colors in our mind before we, we do this. And we cut out each color on this film. It's called Ru Ruby Lith Film. And uh, this is, this would be the dark blue. And what I did was like, I first printed like a light light gray. And this is the dark blue. And I have to do this all by, by hand, by eye, with a uh, X-Acto knife. And it, it drives you nuts. It drives you totally crazy. but. Now, how, how does this fit into the screen? Did you put this on top of the screen material? Yeah. Um, w what this does is it this red blocks the light. See what what you do is you uh, you coat the screen with a, a photo light sensitive emulsion, and which is light sensitive. It's just like film. Okay. You turn the lights on and it's it's shot. Okay. So and it's it's all done in a dark room, and what you do is you you put this on the on the screen when it's done, face down when it's dry, when the screen's dry, and uh, then you shoot it with a high intensity light. And what, <clears throat> what is not exposed, which is red, will, will, will wash out in water eventually when, it's, you know, when you're ready to shoot it. And w what is not, what is exposed here will stay in the screen. It's like a stencil, okay? And so, uh, so what you see that this red will eventually print when the thing is shot. Now, the building that we're in now, Saturn Studio Building, this is this is your creative studio where we are right now. And then you have the like a workshop where you, yeah. you actually do the print work itself. And then upstairs now you have a residence. You live upstairs. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and, and who you live with up there. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll tell you, I have a very, very loud roommate up there. Um, but she's cool. She's cool. She's a feathered dog. She's, she's a chainsaw with feathers. If I let her out, she'll eat every wood piece in the whole building. You better explain who she is. Uh, she's a cockatoo. <laughs> Zone, so stay tuned for a damn so I, I teach during the summers at a, it's a school called the International School of Art, and it's in Toady. And uh, Where when is I, Toady? it's about two hours north of Rome, and it's a great program, you know. And uh, I was really lucky to get it. So it's, it's in this 13th century town over here, and uh, it's on this hillside, and you just get this entire view of, of, of sort of this Italian landscape. And it's, when I got there, I was just completely knocked out, and I loved it. And, uh, you know, it looks just like a Piero painting or a, mm -hmm. or a Giotto, and it, it really hasn't changed since then. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're just, you're just repainting these, these old scenes. And so... Uh, you know, that with the light just became so much a part 
of my work. And so I would go out every day and, and work on these smaller paintings, pretty much from direct observation. And uh, they sort of infused me with a kind of, the kind of light, you know, I think most painters are searching for a kind of light that sort of reflects back to them. At least a lot of, I think, observational painters, it re reflects back to them a light they can believe in. And I think when I hit, when I hit Italy, that just became the kind of light I'd been looking for. Well, I originally would start a lot of these earlier paintings. This painting has started actually from a dream. And the dream was about a, uh, a large bed with four, being held up in, in an expanse of sand with four jockeys holding the bed up, four of those people that, you know, hold those things. And, and that, was the, that was really the genesis for the painting. And it sort of started to trigger other images. And, and I would, for a long time, I worked from dreams and would get little, little pieces of imagery and would start to put them in and take them out of paintings and sort of create these cinematic dramas using these, these, these you know, little pieces of observable fact that for me started to carry a lot of emotional charge. You know, and the shell for me was, was more about a kind of, uh, seems to be one of the few animals that carries its own home on its back, you know, and it's always at home and it became a, a kind of symbol for okay. that for me, yeah. So I think of them as like whole worlds where, where things happen and things resolve and things get played out. And, and then I tend to take that from painting to painting, that, that sense of, uh, you know, within, within my own psyche of things starting to like fall apart and come together and resolve themselves. And, well, I think of, no, I think of them as, uh, you know, I had said, I think I wrote in my statement how important I think the sense of childhood is and to retain that and uh, to have a sense of the, the kind of innocence of that, the smallness of that, and how if, if people are small, then things become larger. So it's, it's, it's the sense of the person in terms of the contrast of what's going on. And, uh, you know, I like putting that, positing those together with other with larger people. So I like, it's really about a scale shift more. It also seems like the, the children in the paintings are making discoveries. Mm -hmm. they're, they're sort of searching mm -hmm. and are finding and, and trying to uh, you know, be, the, be the ones who are... Um, yeah, well that's, yeah, I think yeah. that's a good point, yeah. I think that's the part of myself I really, I locate in the painting. You know, actually, both male and female, as a, as a, the place where you really start, or really the first place where you really felt things in, in a very real way. And I think for me, painting is about trying to reconnect with that. You know. A bit about many of the figures have animal heads or masks. Mm -hmm. um, would you talk about that and what why? What does that mean? Why is that important? Um, well, I think it becomes a more direct, you know, expression of of the person next to a person, you know. So that I, I again, I'm really interested in, in the whole sense of animals and people, mm -hmm. and 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 how we identify with animals, how I identify with animals, mm -hmm. and how that gets acted out in sort of our interpersonal relationships and how one can you know, be an animal and be different animals all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And what was hard for me for a long time was to uh, integrate that with, with my sense of uh, observation and of, you know, of the real. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to make a kind of psychic leap where everything could be felt as real even though it wasn't seen as real. You know, and I think that's, for me, the big jump in my work that I'm able to you know, if I, if I think it, it's real. And it's, but it all gets expressed in sort of the real terms of the light. The thing you get most attached to in the painting, which becomes sort of the impetus for the painting, seems to be, at one point, the thing that gets in the way of seeing the whole painting. And I find myself sort of playing hide and seek with that as, a, as kind of the lock in the painting and then the thing that keeps it from going any further.
So you don't want to repeat the painting, but I want to keep talking about this kind of emotional life, but seen differently. And so that's how you know things can go from here to here to here to over to here over to here, but hopefully they get they get transformed through painting, and that's what that's why the painting is so important, the act of painting, because you know I mean it seems silly, but you actually you know get attached to certain things, and you don't want to let them go, you know, and you feel like your whole life depends on keeping that one figure. <laughs> of course, you know at that point that's the time to let it go. But then you think the whole painting's going to fall apart. And, mm -hmm. and that's the kind of gap I like to fall into and stay in a painting, where you think the whole painting's going to fall apart. And, you know, hopefully for me, that's what my painting does for myself. It, it functions as a kind of interface between that stuff all you don't know. And somehow you find your, you, you make a world. And, uh, you know, I have some, some really nice masks and I have a, a real interesting skull that, even though I don't paint it, I think about a lot because it's a uh, it's a piece of it's a it's a gorilla skull and basket, and it, it was used as a whenever there was a problem in a tribe or or someone had to speak to the tribe as a whole, he they had to hold this mask in a circle, and then the mask uh, well it was the skull, and that contained then they had to speak to tr sort of the truth. And I, I sort of like that function of painting, where, where it becomes sort of like the, the skull and you have to kind of speak the truth. And, uh, but the thing about what's interesting about this mask, it wasn't thought of so much as an art object, and usually they were destroyed because they held too much, and then they'd make another one, which is a very brave idea. I mean, I'm not brave enough to destroy my paintings. But. Would, would you talk or address the issue of the importance of painting today. You know, there's the whole discussion now, is, mm -hmm. is painting dead, is it mm -hmm. alive, is it whatever. Do you talk about that in terms of... Well, know? I mean, people, I think it's a kind of ridiculous argument. It's like, is religion, you know, it's always, it's a, it's a part of our culture, you know, and, and I think whether you choose to, to respond to it or not has nothing to do with whether it exists or not. And, uh, you know, I think it's a really, it's a very viable form. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe in it that way. And I try to, imp as a teacher, I try to impart that. I mean, that's really the, you know, the dye in the water where I teach. Because a lot of people nowadays, you know, they, they, they'll come out of a critical issues class and they're just, they've been like hamstrung. I mean, they're, they, they can't paint because painting is dead. And so... You know, I feel like I'm the bicycle pump, you know, <laughs> you can do it, you can do it. You know, and not even that I care. It's just that, I mean, if they, I, I don't have this, I don't feel like I'm spreading the word or anything, but, but I think it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's an important thing to do if your inclinations tend towards that way. And I hate to see people talked out of it because of, uh, you know, some silly notion about, you know, modernity or, or contemporary art and uh, so I'm kind of always in there I said well you, it's pop painting is possible just show us how you know you be the one and, mm -hmm. and I like to come very much from that point of view that you know maybe maybe it'll be you you know let's see your work you know that your palette very much reflects the way you paint you know and I think it's the sort of accruing I think of my paintings again as very archaeological sort of things on top, on top, built in a mm -hmm. kind of stratified, mm -hmm. horizontal, vertical. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so the, the funny thing is mess becomes very much part of making order for me. So I like, to, I like the sense of making order out of this huge mess. I mean, I've tried, I, I start a, can a canvas and I have a nice big piece of glass. I keep it down there because I never use, <laughs> it's clean and... Right. You know, and, and, and I don't know how to make clear decisions until I start to get in these little sort of valleys and rivulets. And, and that's kind of how I paint. That's...
Hi, I'm Marilyn Moore from Gallery 451, and we're going to be talking about the recent show we had here, Ahead of My Times, which was a one-man self-portraits of Dave Lundahl, uh, who is a Beloit artist. Tell us a little bit about, about the show and the concept behind it. Well, um, Dave's work, as when we first met him, was primarily all the sculpture here. Um, and that's how we met him and were, were thinking in terms of doing a show of all the sculpture. And he was at that point beginning to work on um, a new concept that he had uh, doing a lot of ph photographic work, um, entirely self-portraits. Uh, what he does is he alters, mostly he alters light, although he will go so far as to put on makeup and alter his physical appearance. He will also cast shadows on his face in addition to altering light. And what he does is he will hold a handful of mirrors um, in one hand and a little Polaroid camera in another hand. And he's not really concerned with, you know, a real specific photographic image because he's trying to get this abstracted kind of a look um, out of all of that. And the lights and shadows that are cast on his face from the mirror images is it, is what you basically end up seeing. He will even um, mat them in such a way that you don't see the entire face. You only see a certain portion of it because he only wants you to see that that really abstract quality that he's that he's gotten out of all of this. What you see here is um, all found materials, mostly uh, cast iron work that are. Um, knobs, wheels, and so forth, with these really fun anthropomorphic hinges and bits of slag from foundry floors that he scraped up that have uh, a human type of quality to them as, as in the back there and so forth. Um, and they, they look very toy-like, although they are really entirely sculptures. He also does this really... Um, wonderful altered sound music that um, he also takes toys and and alters you just just random sounds using toys that he's taken apart I mean he just he goes into the toy section and he finds all these really goofy little things that kids play with and he takes them apart and he uses the sounds and he enhances them he distorts them um, he combines them with all kinds of other noise making types of things to create this wonderful music so each aspect of his art from the sculpture to the photography to the um, to the music is all very interconnected um, and um, and very much related to his background in psychology and his background uh, with his family history as toy makers and that sort of thing. It's really very fascinating. And and I think I think what's also interesting about his art is the more you learn about him, the more you learn about why his art is what it is, and you have this really great appreciation than for what it is that he's really doing with all of that. To just come in and randomly look at his work might seem very esoteric um, on the surface if you don't really know what he's all about. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions or comments, give us a call at 968-0123 or stop in at J.R. Cortman Center for Design downtown at 107 North Main. Once again, thanks for watching The Art Zone.
The Art Zone is funded by J.R. Cortman, Center for Design, Downtown Rockford. This is the Art Zone. This is the Art Zone. This is the Art Zone. This is the Art Zone.